Good morning. God bless you. We want to welcome everyone to the house of the Lord. And uh, as we continue to uh, just be in the presence of the Lord, uh, my prayer is that the word of God would speak, the word of God would penetrate, the word of God would convict and correct if necessary, and more than anything, help us to do what God has called us to do. We want to welcome our online community as well for those that are joining us uh, via live stream. Uh, God bless you, and our prayer is that you too receive a personal touch from the Holy Spirit. I want to um, get right into the message. I've got a lot to cover. For those of you that were here last week, I mentioned that we were uh, beginning the uh, spiritual disciplines part one. And so today is the spirit, uh, the spiritual disciplines part two. That is the message of today's title. Um, and I want us to uh, look together at our foundational verse for this study in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 through 8. And I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation, but you can follow along with any translation that you have. We also will have it up on the board. At this time, if you have a Bible um, or don't have a Bible, you can lift up your hand and we can have somebody pass out Bibles that we keep in the back in the lobby. It's important, especially if you are a believer, to always have a Bible. So the gentleman in the back with the red uh, uh, sweatshirt, if you can get him a Bible, uh, thank you so much. And uh, the gentleman in the black hat, if you can get him a Bible as well, be patient, we'll make sure you get one. Um, here we go. In verse 7, it says, Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself, someone say train, train. yourself to be godly. And verse 8, it says, physical training is, of, is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. We see the aspect of eternity in this scripture, meaning that God prioritizes our eternity more than our temporary life here on earth. And so we read in the word of God that we're to train ourselves to be godly. Training requires our participation. Training requires that we participate in the process of instruction and discipline in order to grow in godliness. And so we, you and I, we have to do our part. We have to co-labor with God so he can do in us all he desires to do. Amen? Amen. So the spiritual disciplines are a primary part of our training. And the main emphasis is this, that the spiritual disciplines train us to be godly with the end goal of total transformation. Some will say total transformation. I say this often, but one of the primary goals of Christianity is transformation. So we don't just step into this new life and stay the same. That's, all things have passed away. All things have become new. Now we got to catch up to the newness. We got to engage in the process of training. Amen? And so these disciplines that we practice, which we will discuss in a moment, enable us to experience the grace of God and his transforming power. That's how it happens. These, these spiritual practices can also be referred to as the means of grace or the methods of transformation. But this is what begins to happen as we engage. So today, we're going to review two categories of the spiritual disciplines. And I want to say that both of these categories um, provide a balance to our spiritual growth. So the, the disciplines that we're going to discuss help us. They balance us. We can't just do one only or one aspect of the categories only. We have to engage in as many or all of these as possible. Now, first, I want to talk about the disciplines of abstinence. I'm going to say abstinence. 
The disciplines of abstinence are important because, point one, abstinence keeps our desires in check. Abstinence keeps our desires in check. Now you're probably thinking, what kind of abstinence? It's not just one area. It's several areas. Look at what the Bible says. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, that's what you and I are when we are no longer of this world because we've given our life to Jesus, this really, this world is not our home. Now we become foreigners and exiles. That's what that scripture means. And then it says to abstain from sin sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Let me say that again. Dear friends, I urge you, I plead with you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Now the word abstain means that we voluntarily refrain ourselves from doing or enjoying something that we like. In the disciplines of abstinence, we abstain to some degree and from time to time from the satisfaction of normal and legitimate activities, right? Such as food, sleep, sex if you're married, and even people interaction. And we do this intentionally so that we keep our natural desires from turning into sinful desires. You see, over and over again, God's people know how to push and push and push. They take something good and turn it into bad. They take food and turn it into gluttony. So there's different reasons why we learn to practice the discipline of abstinence. Now, we do this intentionally. When we practice the disciplines of abstinence, we are doing so uh, and, and putting these natural desires in proper submission to God. That's how we do it. A lot of times we think, well, I can't submit this to God or I can't submit that, submit that to God. It's because we haven't been intentional about the process. What I'm going to do today briefly, as, as quickly as I can, is just lay out some of the different types of disciplines under both categories so I can plant the seed and you can begin to understand. Now, some of you may already be practicing these disciplines, but maybe you didn't have the language for it or didn't really understand what it was meant to do in your life. And so we want to attempt today to help you just a little bit more in your walk with God, specifically in these two areas. Now... Each of these disciplines or these categories of disciplines play a different role, but each teach us self-control. So they play a different role, but they teach us self-control. Now, here are some of the disciplines of abstinence that I want us to understand. Now, number one is the discipline of solitude. Now, what does that mean? Well, in solitude, we abstain from interaction with other people for a time. Now, in the book of Luke, chapter 5, 16, it says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Why was he doing that? He was demonstrating to us that he needed to be alone with the Father. And so do we. There's a purpose for us practicing solitude and the purpose is to be alone with God with no distractions and no one else around now I know it seems simple but let me tell you it's probably one of the hardest ones that people can practice because they don't understand or don't like to be alone and I get it we're made to be in community but there is a purpose for us being alone this is the time that allows you and I the opportunity to confront our soul and everything that may be hindering our relationship with God. So we get alone and we ask the Lord to show us what is inside of us that needs to be removed so that there's no blockages in our walk with him. Be, being alone helps us to look at things that normally escape our attention because we're so busy being around each other all the time. 
We, we have to come alone and we have to be with the Lord. It's one of the first things the Lord began to teach me. He says, get away. And for me during that time was the closet, was the, well, I called it the prayer closet. It was my garage. And I didn't know what was happening, but I knew I just had to sit there. I just, it, it's like an innate instinct almost that our spirit craves when we take time to do that. And we just sit there. Nobody else around. And we wait upon the Lord. And we begin to just be, be still long enough to hear. Now, some ways that people practice the discipline of solitude is to go away on a retreat, which is very good, by the way. It's good for your soul. I do it. I tell my husband to do it. You know, many things have happened during this time on a retreat. I know our core values, the, the different core values that we have as a church, people who pray, people who worship, right? They were all in his retreat when he went away. That's how he came back one day. Here are the core values after like two or three days on a retreat. I recently finished a teaching on soul care, a soul care series. That was birthed out of my retreat in 2020. So many things can happen when we get away and we're alone. Now, for some of us that may be single mothers or that we're just so busy, we're like, well, how can I get away? Well, you can start small. Like I said, just go in your room, close the door, lock it, put a sign on the outside. Alone with God. Do not disturb until... You can do that, you know? We're so creative. You can do that. You can go to your restroom. You can go to your garage. You can go to your car. The point is, be alone and listen. Which leads me to the next one, is the discipline of silence, where we abstain from sounds and noise, TV, and even talking. <laughs> You'd be surprised. What do you mean? We're just going to sit there and do... We are going to do something. Don't say nothing. So much happens in that time. It's profound and it's powerful. In Psalm 23, 2, the Bible says, He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. This is not just referring to those that have passed on. This is for those that are alive. This was King David writing this psalm. He was still alive. He leads me beside quiet waters. It's wonderful to have nothing but silence. Silence is good for the soul. Sometimes it's a complete shock. We, we, we find out when we do get alone and we do become silent because we're not used to it. We think, we think that we're missing out on something. We think that everything is taking place and all the action is happening around us and we just got to hurry up and get this over with and get back out there into the real world. Nothing can be farther from the truth. If you have been restless in your soul, get alone before God and be quiet. And you'll hear God begin to speak life and refresh your soul once again. It's good for our soul. It allows us to concentrate upon God and hear his voice. And it trains us also to be less talkative and more, or I should say better at listening. Better at listening. It works really good with the, with the discipline of solitude. And as, as well as what we do when we get alone, we come before the Lord Maybe in the early hours before anybody gets up and before there's any kind of noise or traffic happening, whether it's midnight, whether it's three in the morning, four in the morning, you can set your alarm and you can be very intentional about that and get ready the night before. Get ready the night before. If you are willing, there's a way. There's a way. Now, these are the disciplines for those that are born again Christians. Now, the third one is fasting. In fasting, we abstain from food and possibly drink as well. Now, there's so much that happens in fasting. I'm not going to talk about the breakthroughs and the miracles and all of that, although that's part of fasting. Right now, we're training ourselves in self-control and humility, which is what fasting does. Fasting helps us. It doesn't turn us into a monster. It shouldn't. When you have the proper perspective when it comes to fasting... You'll engage, and when you see yourself starting to get, you know, out of character, you stop. You just went through an aspect of training. You pause, you step back. Lord, I need your help here. 
I need your help. I, I, I don't want this to take me in a different direction. I want to be trained. That's why I'm fasting. And then you get back in and you'll find that as you keep engaging, little by mi little, maybe one meal, and then the next time is two meals, the next time is three meals, and pretty soon you can go on from there. I wouldn't say start with a 40-day water fast or start with a three-day Esther fast, which is no food and no drink. Start where you can. And then God will show you everything else that fasting was meant to do in your life. I wish I can get into this more specifically, but our time is short. You can research and read books and articles and videos and, 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 and develop a, a good understanding of what the spiritual discipline is meant to do in terms of our spiritual growth. Now, fasting also confirms our dependence upon God. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. By fasting, we discover that food is not all there is to it. There's more to life than food. We also discover that our belly is not our God. It's our servant. I said it's not our God. It's our servant. We say no when it's time to put the fork and the knife down. There's different types of fasting, as I said, that you can research. If you are under doctor's orders, we always advise you to take caution and, of course, make sure that you are able to engage at your capacity. Now, the fourth one is the discipline of chastity. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot, but I'll say a little today. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says that each of you shall know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, culture has a way of distorting our perspective, and we buy into everything that we see out there, even in our day and age. And unfortunately, we, we've allowed purity and modesty to become swallowed up because of what we see and allow uh, in the world through what we watch on TV, maybe magazines, and we get enticed. We want to look like supermodels. We want to do this. We want to do that. Let me tell you, we are to sanctify ourselves, right? We are to be honorable vessels unto God, even in how we dress. If you are a woman of God, there's no place for some of the things that are happening around us. No cleavage. I'm, not if you're a woman of God. No cleavage, no midriff, no showing the bottom part. None of that should even be close to being seen on the body of a woman of God. Let me take you a little deeper. Even at the beach, who said that you can wear a bikini. Who said? Oh. Not even. <laughs> That's deception. We cover up. Some of you, I understand, you're new, and maybe you never understood this, period. You've been serving God for a long time. I I'm helping you today that that is not the, uh, the appropriate way we honor God with our body. Just because a hundred other people are laying on the beach exposing everything, I'm sorry, but we come the way we would come if we were walking down the street and bumping into our other brothers and sisters across our path. Amen? That's how we grow. We train ourselves. So, we go home. It's hot. We want to go to the beach. I heard something the other day. And that just really doesn't fit me anymore. I've had this conversation with God and me, by the way. He had to take me through my closet. He says, no, no, I don't think so. There's so much that God has. So I'm only telling you what God has done for me. All right? I'm not telling you to do something I haven't done. Now, according, right, to Dallas Willard, even in the context of marriage, because much harm and suffering has come from indulgence in these, in these lustful or sensual indulgences, not just in our attire, but in our thoughts, our feelings, and our attitudes, and even within marriage relationships. Dallas Willard, who's the Christian author of The Spirit of the Disciplines, he said it's vital to the health of any marriage that sexual gratification not be placed at the center. Unlike secular thinking. Why? Because this allows us to love and appreciate our spouse as whole people, not just as sexual beings. 
I'm sorry, that's not all there is to a marriage. Is it important? Yes, but that's not everything there is. That is not everything there is. Now the fifth one is secrecy. Now some of you are like, what do you mean secrecy? Sounds strange. Well, let me tell you what it is. In the discipline of secrecy, we abstain from causing our good deeds and our generous giving to be known to everybody. We don't have to walk around with our checkbook telling everybody how much we just gave. That is so inappropriate. Jesus himself taught this in Matthew 6, 3 through 4. It says, but when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So we don't do things so that everybody can say, wow. We do those things because we're training to be godly and because we want to honor God for the purpose of honoring God. Not to hear what other people have to say. And so we have to keep it in perspective. Remember, we're, we're, we're rewiring our perspective today. For some of us, we're learning, wow, is this what it's meant to do? Yes. The Bible doesn't just say do these things because you have to, because they're rigid and, and routine. No, do them because they're going to train you to be godly. Now, secondly, the second category is the disciplines of engagement. And that's point two today. Engagement requires our effort in order to endure. Let me say that again. Engagement requires our effort in order to endure. It involves effort and participation in order to finish our divine race well. I said, well. In Luke 13, 24, the Bible says, make every effort, and this is in the words of Jesus, to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Now, part of this speaks to the deception in the last days. Many people will think they're saved, but they're not. Why? Because the Bible says that we're to work out our salvation with fear and with trembling. If there's no fear and no trembling and no awe or reverence for God, then we have to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. We have to. We have to. In the discipline of engagement, we have to make every effort to enter in and partake of the spiritual resources that God has laid out for us so that we do not fall short in our walk with God. Now let's take a look at the disciplines of engagement. The first one is the study. Someone say study. We have to study God's word, not just browse through it like a magazine or a history book but we have to intentionally study God's word and we have to engage uh we have to engage the word of God intentionally in 2nd Timothy chapter 3 16 through 17 in the amplified classic edition the bible says this that every scripture is God breathed given by his inspiration and profitable, meaning beneficial, for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action, so that the man or woman of God may be complete and proficient, well fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every, not some, every good work. So we have to engage in the study of God's word. We have to actually look up these words that we're reading in the page of scripture so that we can understand what they mean. You know, the Bible says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. It's because we don't really study to know. We just read to get it out of the way. Many times that should not be the case. 
just as we go through elementary and high school and even college, we should have our highlighters, our pens, our notebooks, our dictionaries, our concordance, and every other spiritual resource God gives to us so that we can dig deep and understand what his word really, truly means. The second one is worship. Now, to worship is to see God as worthy and to ascribe great worth to him. Now, with this perspective, we dwell upon God and we express the greatness of who he is. It goes way beyond just a song. Although we can sing our own song unto the Lord. You can actually sing unto the Lord even with no music in the background. Now, when we worship the Lord and we're alone with the Lord or whether we're here together, we keep at the forefront of our mind just how great God is and how mighty he is. It's just this reminder that, God, you are great no matter what. The Bible says in Psalm 145.3, great is the Lord and most worthy of praises. His greatness no one can fathom. When we worship God, we're posturing our heart toward God, and we're, comp- we're increasing our capacity to love him, to fear him, and to know him. That's what happens when we come to God with this posture of training our heart to know him so that we can love him and properly fear him, respectfully fear him. And so that's what happens when we intentionally engage in worship with God. Now, the next one is service. In serving others, we train ourselves away from arrogance and from pride, complacency, and we learn to work with one another peacefully and joyfully. That's what the purpose is. So so if we're not working together peacefully and joyfully, we miss the purpose of serving. So if we're, if we're complaining or grumbling or upset about something, we got to get away. Lord, what's happening here? I'm not allowing myself to be trained. I'm upset. I'm looking at everything around me. I'm comparing. I'm doing this. No. No, 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 no. Perspective. Retrain. Rewire. I'm here so that I can learn how to serve joyfully and get along with others peacefully. That's one of the primary purposes of serving God. And we serve him not to be seen by man, not to get accolades or pats on the back, although that's good and that's nice, but that's not the purpose. We come because we want to honor God and serve God's people. Amen. And we do this in every place and space that we occupy, either here in the church or even at home or in our neighborhood. We do those things at home and in our neighborhood as well. We serve one another. We learn how to serve one another well in every place that we occupy. Now, next is prayer. Now, we've heard many times that prayer changes things, but you know it begins with us. Prayer changes things beginning with us. Prayer engages us in this dynamic, life-giving, life-changing, interactive communication with God. God begins to do something supernaturally inside of us when we call upon God. It trains us, prayer trains us to depend upon God. And we learn how to watch and pray lest we enter into temptation. There's a quote by E.M. Bounds who's a foremost authority on prayer. And he says that prayer as a mere habit or a performance gone through by routine or in a professional way is a dead and rotten thing. It's like a vain repetition. It serves no purpose in the kingdom of God. So we have to learn to pray God's way. He goes on to say, much time alone with God is the secret of knowing him. For our ability to stay with God in our prayer closet measures our ability to stay with God outside of the closet. Did you catch that? So if we're not staying much time with God in the prayer closet, then we can't expect to be with him and walk for him outside of the prayer closet. In other words, the temptations and everything is going to cause us to buckle at the knee and enter into temptation temptation and sin because we're not spending time with God in prayer. So there's no secret or no mystery why there are some people who just continue to live a life of ungodliness. It's because they're not spending time with God in prayer. Now in Hebrews 4.16, the Bible says, come boldly, boldly into my throne room of grace where I will give you help and mercy in your time of need. 
We need the help and the mercy of God to break us free from these bondages and these areas of sinfulness that we've allowed to remain in our life. Now, finally, is the discipline of confession. It is so important. And if you didn't know this by now, it's actually tied to our healing. A lot of us don't understand this. In James 5.16, the Bible says, confess your sin one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed for the effective fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much not little but much when we trust others with our weaknesses and our failures we're really allowing God to look closer into our heart because now we're exposing ourselves we're becoming transparent with one another and that's why the Bible says that we're to confess our sin one to another. And, and not just any old sin, but we're, we're actually supposed to be together in community and help each other out to overcome these sins. And sit down with each other and say, listen, this is what is happening in my life. And allow one another to encourage and to speak into one another. And allowing ourselves to be asked these questions such as, what sins have you committed recently? What temptations have you dealt with how were you delivered or not delivered out of those temptations have you thought said or done anything of which you are not aware if it's a sin or not a sin so we can help you and finally are you keeping something secret see the bible says in proverbs 28 verse 13 that he who covers his sins will not prosper but whoever confesses and forsakes his sins them will have mercy there is power in god's mercy and the spiritual discipline of confession helps us to obtain the mercy of god and remove these life draining burdens and help us to avoid sin there is a way in which we can live a holy and godly way more and more each day. And it begins with engaging in these spiritual disciplines. Now, we're going to spend just a moment as I call the worship team back up to just reflect. I know it was a lot. But I really want us to understand the purpose of these disciplines because God gives us resources there's these, power, these powerful resources that God gives us so that we can engage and not just hear about them. He says, be not only a hearer, but a doer of the word of God. And if you're here today and you mean business, God means business. He says, if you are willing to draw near to him, he's willing to draw near to you. And I want to ask for those that are serious and those that really want to pursue God in this area, which is the area which is total transformation. Let's bow our hearts and our heads for just a moment with no distractions and no getting up and walking around. Let's just be silent before the Lord. Let's begin to practice the discipline of silence. And yes, we're going to have music, but let's not talk. Let's not walk. Let's hone in and let's see what God has to say for just a moment. And then I'll pray. Philippians 3 13 the Bible says brethren I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward toward those things which are ahead I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus if today you desire to draw near to God and you desire prayer for God to touch your heart 
and train you in his ways I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand and I'm going to pray over us with no shame whether we've been serving God for one day 10 years with God he can lead us right where we're at and take us into the place that he desires Father we come before you in Jesus name and we ask you Lord God to hear our prayer we ask you Lord God to come and to stir us up once again to awaken our soul and cause us to hunger and thirst for more of you Lord as we take concrete steps towards you you promise to take steps toward us and we ask you Lord God to help us engage in the practice of these spiritual disciplines for the purpose of being trained in godliness so that we can be totally transformed oh God you said Lord in 1st Thessalonians 5 23 that you the God of peace are able to sanctify us entirely through and through spirit soul and body so we ask you today Lord God for an extra measure of grace and mercy to come upon us Lord God that we may not fall short in this divine race but be able to stand before you face to face in that day and hear these words well done my good and my faithful servant enter ye in Lord we want that to be us so help us while we are on this side of heaven to engage to hunger to thirst to partake and to do all that you have called us to do let none of us be left lacking let none of us be left behind help us Lord God we trust you today Lord and we thank you Lord God for what you've done and what you are doing have your way Lord in the name of Jesus we pray amen and amen God bless you we love you and we are here after service we're gonna have a time of prayer if anybody needs additional prayer we're gonna line up the pastors at this time we're gonna enter into our time of worship through our tithes and our offerings with Pastor Martin God bless you amen come on let's give the Lord some praise